Yeah, the, yes. and the waiting room is enabled, so people will just join as they join. Okay, okay great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this online event hosted by Humber College as we celebrate National Engineering Month, the month where a Canadian engineering community comes together to celebrate engineering excellence. My name is Janet Bedard, and I'm honored to be the moderator this evening. This National Engineering Month is particularly exciting for us at Humber College oh, as we are launching as we are launching new engineering degrees in mechatronics, information systems engineering, and the built environment this fall. These new four-year degrees are uh, complementing our existing portfolio of technician, technology, uh, degree, apprenticeship, and graduate certificate programs, to name a few. Um, first, I'd like to start uh, uh, to share our Humber, uh, Humber land acknowledgement. So Humber College is located within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, known as Adobacoke, the place of the alders, in Michisaugig language, the region is uniquely situated along Humber River watershed, which historically provided an integral connection for Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat people between the Ontario Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bays regions. Now home to people of numerous nations, Adobacoke continues to provide a vital source of interconnection for all. Humber College and the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Technology, known as FAST, is a proud sponsor of this annual month-long tribute to engineering. And today is a special day where we celebrate women's achievements um, in engineering and increase visibility to forge a gender equal world. All gender identities are welcome at our event, of course, and we look forward to engaging with you. On International Women's Day, we're celebrating women's achievements in engineering and technology, and we've assembled a diverse and extraordinary panel to shine a spotlight on women, uh, their journey and contribution to engineering and technology. So we invite you to stay connected and engaged with us on our social channels, including hashtag NEM2021 and hashtag HumberFAST. Tonight, our panel is comprised of Humber College FAST faculty, staff, and alumni who will share their insights, experiences, and career journeys in the celebration of women in engineering and technology. And we invite you to, to engage with our panelists. If you have a question for our panel or for a speaker, please include your question along with your panelists' name in our chat, and we'll allocate 10 minutes at the end of our discussion to answer your questions. Now, please let me welcome our panelists from the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Technology at Humber. Dr. Farzad Rayagani is a Senior Dean of FAST. He is also the Chair of Heads of Technology for Colleges Ontario. Dr. Rayagani has successfully led a coalition to reshape engineering education, created new pathways through collaborative partnerships, and is dedicated to continuing to build a sustainable and educational system. Hello, Farzad. Good, good evening and uh, happy International Women Day to all my colleagues around the world and especially to my co-panelists here and audience in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Farzad. Uh, early in her career, she was offered a pink hard hat and asked to take meeting notes. Now, Dr. Martine Spinks is an Associate Dean for Humber's Design and Built Environment and is now administering one of our three new Bachelor of Engineering degrees at Humber College. Martine, welcome. Hi, thank you so much, Janet. From going, growing up in Iran to studying and working in Sweden before immigrating to Canada, Dr. Setre Jangbaksh has had a fulfilling career in energy and sustainability management and built environment. Today, she is a Humber College professor and develops course materials for engineering degrees. Hello, Setre. Hello, everybody. Nice to see everybody here. Thank you. Marilyn Spink is an industry liaison for work integrated learning and industry engagement at Humber. She's an award winning engineer and Marilyn's work has taken her around the world delivering large engineering projects, including advising the Tunisian government on the modernization of their state owned steel industry. Thank you for joining us, Marilyn. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> 
Marimwit Demise is a recent graduate of Humber's Electromechanical Engineering Technology Program. She's now working at the Barrett Center for In Innovation Technology at Humber as a STEM coach and additive manufacturing lead. So welcome, Marimwit. Thank you. Have. Honored to be here. And once again, I'm Janet Bedard. Um, I've worked in industry for over 10 years in environmental manufacturing and quality engineering for Canadian companies. And for the last 10 years, I made a right turn on my career. I, I, I came to academia about 10 years ago and I've applied my industry knowledge to teach and develop curriculum for post-secondary uh, engineering education. So a warm welcome to our panelists and viewers joining us this evening. The first thing I'd like to ask so we all get to know each other a little bit better is to ask each of our panelists to tell us briefly what inspired you to pursue your career path. And I'll start with Martine. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, this is gonna be such a varied answer as across this panel, it'll be so interesting. I think that's probably 20, 25 years ago, um, we were discussing things like engineering or architecture uh, and things that were quite siloed. And in my mind, I had always kind of challenged and been very passionate about um, more of a systems kind of approach to sustainability in the built environment. And I never set out to do a PhD, but I came across an incredible mentor in a woman named um, Professor Yvonne Ryden, who's at University College London, where I did my PhD. And we met when I was at London School of Economics. And she thought it was okay to ask all these questions. And I was a consultant for a while and I was not a very good one because I kept delivering solutions to the client. But then I'd say, we haven't thought about this or we haven't thought about that. So um, I just started asking more and more questions and I felt safe with the, my mentor to ask more questions. Um, and really now here I am setting up uh, Canada's newest engineering degree with my colleagues and we're creating safe spaces for students to come in and, and challenge and ask those very questions uh, leading into new technologies in engineering and, and really fielding new boards. Thank you, Martine. Marilyn, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. I guess uh, in, in my states in the early 80s, uh, so I'm dating myself, uh, they were really pushing a lot of women to go into engineering. And when my guidance counselor said, you know, you do really, really well at math and science, why don't you think about engineering? And I said, I don't want to drive a train. So I don't know why, who, what I thought, you know, and who I thought built uh, sort of the physical ara world around us. I was saying, go so scientists study what is, but engineers create that which has never been. So I ended up pursuing engineering and I loved it because it was applied science, practical, that you know, sort of met my practical side. And um, I ended up choosing the discipline of metallurgy because I love art. And um, I was fascinated when in the high temperature chemistry of pottery, I, would, I did a lot of pottery and you could take mud and make something very practical out of it. But then you can make something of beauty with all these minerals and glazes. And, and so that actually what is what drew me to sort of the fire and brimstone of metallurgy and foundries and all that. That was my path. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. Cetera, would you like to share with us? Yeah, for sure. So uh, the journey started when I went and uh, moved to the Sweden to do my master's. So I started to be involved in, in each a single courses that we had, we had a project. And what we did is we worked in a team and we sit together, we do collaboration, actually student, right? So to make the project happen. So that's make me really inspired and passionate about uh, how actually project and teamwork works. And then when I saw there, how the women are strong, how they, they are involved in this society, I mean, in industry and make me more passionate about going through the, my PhD to do research, to do modification, design, and all this struggling that engineering do every day. I mean, in a design, I mean, uh, part. So that's why it so inspired me. And then I become very passionate about sustainability in the building and environmental and design to provide food and food for the people. That's actually my journey started. Yeah. Thank you, Cetre. Thank you. Next, we have Farzad. Oh, I, you don't want it to have my, my story. <laughs> oh, no, it's a good one. I have heard it, I think. 
<laughs> so, so as like any any kid at home, I start to break the machines which were perfectly working <laughs> to be able to fix it again. And I was uh, I was very good at that. So, for example, our TV was perfectly working. I did something to break it and and fix it again. Thirty years from now, we call that experiential learning. I didn't know at that time, and I didn't know that how it's possible that because I wasn't good at math and physics at that time. And at that time, at the age of 12 or 13 or 14, the educational system failed me because they told me that you are not good at math and physics. So you are not going to be engineer and you are going to go in the other direction. So they pushed me to other direction. So I had my sister, who, who is actually two years older than me, so I was 13, she was 15. So I went always back to her, learn about math and physics. And after that, in the age of 16, she left the home to California. She has started doing the civil engineering at age 21. She graduated from engineering at age 22. She became engineer and worked in the government of California to build for 13 years the building. And actually she support me the whole my career of the engineering education. So he said that if I can do it, you can do it because you were more hands-on than me. I was good only on math and physics. If you learn the math and physics and everything else, <laughs> if you have a passion for the engineer or for building, you, and she paid for everything. And that was my, my that looking at my sister and say, if she can do it, I can do it. So she becomes civil, I become mechanical engineer. And now continue life is continuing. So now I'm in engineering education. So I don't want anybody else fail because the theme of the today's subject is that there is a place for you in engineering. I believe that for everyone. There is a place for you. Thank you. Thank you, Farzad. Maramwit, you next. All right, thank you. Um, my first inspiration was actually a female math uh, teacher. And I've always thought I was really bad at math. And I never bothered to try because I believed I was bad. But she noticed and um, she saw my potential and guided me to discover my potential and develop the love for math. So when I researched uh, programs in schools where I can implement my newly discovered love for math and my passion for creativity, I came across Humber and the Electromech program. And I arranged uh, a meeting with the program coordinator at that time to see what the Electromech program is all about. And I'm the type of person who enjoys creativity and making something on your own. So when I saw the students' uh, capstone projects, what they made from designing, building, wiring, programming, and bringing their concept to life through engineering, I was so inspired and uh, motivated. And I was like, this is what I wanna be. And I joined and here I am. <laughs> Wonderful, I love that story. Um, for myself, I'm an environmental engineering grad and um, my parents were immigrants to Canada and they pushed education. They saved all their extra pennies and basically said, we don't know what you can do, but just find it and, and do it and, and we'll support you. So from there, it was really, um, I explored a lot and I talked a lot to my teachers. So I had an environmental science teacher in high school who swam with like birds in the Galapagos and she built a, a a garden on our in our school and so I helped her with that and she really inspired me to go into environmental science and then when I got to environmental science at the University of Guelph I didn't quite feel a perfect fit for me and my first professor was um, a professional engineer Isabel Heathcote and I just wanted to know more about engineering I was good at math that was different for me I was pretty good at math and so when I met with her I said tell me what the difference is between an environmental scientist and an environmental engineer and at the time she had framed it that if you like to solve problems and build things design things to kind of clean up the mistakes we've made and the problems we've made in the environment then you might think more about engineering and so that that was it for me I was sold and 
and switched into into engineering and um, never and never looked back. And so um, I I was like Marilyn, where I thought, well, I'm not sure I want to design pipes the rest of my life, but I've, I don't think I've designed pipes more than like for six months. I've done so many different things, and so it's been um, really rewarding. So. Um, thank you all for sharing your journeys with us. Now, as far as Ad mentioned, the theme of the National Engineering Month um, and probably our personal motto moving forward in life is there's a place for you in engineering. And so we're celebrating with the diversity of thought and opportunities and people that make up engineering and technology profession. So I'd like to start with asking Farzad Marilyn um, about the importance of women in, in, in leadership and how they make a positive contribution to our profession. I'll start with you, Marilyn. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, I will. I look at engineering as it, it enhances um, our human existence on this planet. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing more sustainably as time goes on. Um, and the engineering profession, in fact, the whole engineering and technology community really has a moral obligation to be reflective of the society that it serves. And so there's evidence um, and, you know, why women need to be more part of the profession, it's still pretty male dominated, um, is that design bias exists within, you know, sort of with the products uh, of engineering. And some of you might recall um, when the first generation airbags, I use this often as an example, uh, they actually killed many women. And if they were pregnant, harmed or killed their unborn children because the all male design team didn't think to put a smaller crash test dummy in as part of their test program. And there are many, many examples of design bias. So what happens is engineering I think in the past, and I'm seeing more, it was seen as sort of a transactional design, but really it's evolving more towards inclusive design or reciprocal design. And women are already leaders. There's so many women leaders already in our profession and technology. Um, and women bring a much need, needed and different perspective to this engineering design process because we have different experiences. And, um, and it's known even just society that diversity of thought uh, results in, in better, better outcomes. Thank you, Marilyn. Farzad, would you like to add about the importance of women in leadership? Yes, um, so, so if I break down the leadership stage in my mind, so I started by a strategic thinking or visioning. The next step is building the connection. And after that, influencing. And the third is execution of the, your vision. So now if I break the engineering, engineering is to enhance the quality of the life. So we are doing all this strategic thinking as a leader to enhance the quality of the life. Now, imagine that half of us is not involved. So how I can increase the quality of life, enhance of quality of life without having the input of the society, half of the society or the whole diversity of the society. So, it is not about the matter, it is not about the physics, it is about leadership and it is about really what is engineering about. And always for me, engineering was that, what can I do or build that enhance your quality of life together? Now from leadership again, how I can come up with a vision. So if it is only one group in society that come to the vision, so how, how can this vision executed that is good for our whole society. So what is the woman in leadership tell us is that if we are building the society, building the network, building connection to enhance our, and after that influencing the whole society. So we should be somehow mirroring the society. And that is why it's important that how 
contribution of women in leadership and contribution of women in engineering leadership because the two is in hand that it, you, you cannot separate that. As simple as that in, in my mind. Thank you, Farzad and Marilyn. Um, many of us have probably heard that Engineers Canada is committed to the 30 by 30 initiative, which is a goal of raising the percentage of newly licensed engineers who are women to 30% by the year 2030. So the next question I have is what role can we as a society and specifically our education system play to inspire young women to get excited and interested in engineering and technology? And I'll start with Martine. Um, yeah, I think that um, what, what we really need to do is build up role models for young women. I think that that's one of the key things that we need to introduce, both female and male role models. Um, and then in that way, we're going to be breaking down our, our barriers and creating more spaces for, for women in engineering and remembering that what, what I think is really important in creating a, a space for, for girls to enter into education um, is that it's okay to grow into any kind of engineer that you want to be and also to grow into any kind of woman that you want to be. So if you want to be um, a woman in engineering who is uh, wearing nail polish, then you do it. If you want to be two spirited and a woman and an engineer, then you can do it. You, you can be any kind, we have to create these safe spaces because girls are exposed to so many different representations of women through social media from a young age that I think that it, um, we need to make sure that we're creating spaces for girls to see engineering influencers who inspire them to find their unique selves. Um, and then engineering is a really important part of that, especially in the built environment. Um, engineering, when you see, when you look around you and, and you're looking to get girls excited about that and engineering technology, you just show them that there's a safe space for them to come in and, and to, to build their own unique profile for learning. Thank you, Martine. Setre, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Martin, actually, for the input. I believe to the role mod model also. So uh, I believe that we need immersion. We need a deep mental, let's say, involvement society in our culture, uh, especially in our introduced in early education, uh, mentorship, co-op program, we can have a, let's say, female student to hang out to the engineering woman. So I always think about to have a conference, webinar, all this even gathering for the woman. As I, my experience was, uh, I was in some of the, I, I believe some of these engineering boot camp for women is really inspired the student, I mean, from high school. I was always thinking to have some, let's say different field a film, uh, let's say producer, they come to have a, each episode dedicated with a topic for women in engineering. We need a more admission for university at college for the, let's say, girls. So, or especially from industry, what I can see that increases scholarship and involve more in, let's say, hiring. You have a, we have a job fair. All these things that we can inspire and bring, let's say, make it support from industry. How, how much we bring it industry, um, I mean, from early education and, and bring this, they, they know they wanna have a, this commitment and to be a strong after when they wanna graduate and work. So they wanna see that there is something that they're positive. So all this strength, I believe that we can all this model to create the more inspiration and educate people, family, industry, community. Thank you, Satori. Um, Maramwit, would you like to add to that as well? Um, sure. Um, I agree with you guys, what uh, you guys said so far. Um, but the main thing I would say is change the narrative because um, usually engineering is uh, showed as like the dirty job you like the, the, the machine shop where you have to change oil, grease or weld or machine, but that's just one sector of engineering. And there's a wide variety of engineering that girls can go to. And it's truly a, an art form, you know, like we conceive an idea and through engineering, we bring it to life. And we have to show that to girls and show, show them that uh, the personality characteristics that they have is actually, uh, 
suitable to different kinds of engineering, just like the team, there's a place for, uh, for each and every one of us in engineering, right? Um, so high school and middle school uh, schools should expose them to uh, projects so that they can practice their creativity so that they can see what they can make with uh, engineering and what kind of skill sets do, do they require. They need to know that. And uh, elementary and high school uh, school should work on exposing them to this idea so that they're aware. Um, another thing should be uh, build a support system, especially like um, the females that broke the barriers and are in leadership uh, position should guide and uh, mentor the coming generation because representation really matters. Because if a young girl sees uh, women in engineering, then she will know that she can be there if she wants to. So that's that. Thank you, Mayor Witt. Very good points. I think I've heard um, that some of those decisions, you know, kids are being influenced at a very young age. They're not, they're not deciding about engineering necessarily in grade 12 or 11 even. It starts really, really young. So I'm sure with um, the programs you're offering, um, at Humber's Barrett Center, you're seeing young kids and inspiring them. So it's wonderful uh, work that you do. Thank you. So there are a number of days dedicated to shining a spotlight on women, such as International Women's Day and International Women in Engineering Day, to name a few. However, there's really a need to go beyond these days to support diversity in engineering. Um, and so the next question is, how can coaches, mentors, and sponsors play an important role to change the culture of engineering and encourage women to pursue and stay in a career um, in engineering. So I'd like to start with Marilyn. You can start with answering this question. Marilyn, we can't hear you. I think you just need to turn on your mic. I'm sorry Please. to do that. No worries. <laughs> um, all right. Um, hmm. So is this the the one about the mentor and coaching? Yes, coaches, mentors, okay, and sponsors. Sorry, yes. I just, yeah, yeah. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to just sort of share with you, and, and I, I coach and mentor a lot of people. <laughs> they reach out to me. And so like I came, came up with this kind of analogy about a toolbox. So when you graduate from uh, your education and you kind of have tools, but they're not sharp. And um, your coaches, which might be your supervisor at work or um, your boss or some of your colleagues, they'll help you sharpen those tools. Um, but your coaches are people that you need to put in your life when you're in, looking at your career path who are, um, they're going to challenge you. Um, so, sorry, your coaches are the people that are, um, you know, you're working with on the day to day, but you'll have mentors that you need to find. And those are people that will challenge you to grow and stretch beyond your comfort zone and put different kinds of tools in your toolbox. Um, so if you're in engineering, maybe you need to learn a little bit about finance or you need to learn a little bit about public speaking or, or understanding something about marketing. So then what you do is um, you then need sponsors. And those are people in your, your life that you might need in the business that you're working in or your neighbors. And they will talk to people about what a great toolbox you have without you even being in the room. Right? So that's... Um, um, you know, and I, I would like to sort of dispel this rumor that women need mentor, women mentors um, and sponsors. Women need role models. I totally agree with that, um, as you can't be what you can't see. But I would argue that um, women need to seek out as many mentors and sponsors and coaches as you can um, to sort of break through and understand the industries that they've, they've joined. Um, and I think men have a large role to play in the advancement of women in engineering and technology. Thank you, Marilyn. Wonderful. Next, Farzad, if you can um, talk about how coaches, mentors, and sponsors play an important role in engineering. Yes. So, again, all of us are play, must play an important role. And as we know, and I heard from my colleagues here that the environment shapes girls interest and motivation in engineering. So what we are doing to change that environment or enhance the environment that they have more interest going to engineering or as I said before, changing the life. Um, I was in a task force in US for 
engineer in 2030. And, and we were discovering that engineers save lives more than any other discipline um, with the data and this we were showing. So this is, this is in a, a DNA of the, any woman to, again, enhance the quality of the life. The other thing is this, the social bias. So if we are all together as a mentor, as a supervisor, we don't have a social bias toward the woman progress or career choices, that is automatically supporting woman career in engineering. But let's talk about the, the role of the colleges and university and workplaces. I don't think that we are doing enough necessary changes to accommodate our female students. Um, this is what one thing we started here at Humber and, and most of you are involved are in our engineering education and engineering development course development. If you notice by purpose, every task force have an equal female and man uh, as a diverse group to to develop the course. The reason for that is we wanted to have a perspective of the female in our courses at the lowest level to the highest level of engineering. So our curriculum is designed by working together. So that is again from perspective of support system. So now if you are a supervisor, if you are a mentor, if you are a professor in a classroom, if you can enhance that that thinking in the, such a way that, yes, how we can support, how I can support the female students in the classroom um, by, by enhancing the activities, by looking at the activity from the different angles. And, and of course, the lake of the role, role model that for this season is very important to have a workplace that represent the whole society. I hope that eventually we get there. Thank you. Thank you, Farzad. Um, wonderful points. And I'll say that I'm, I'm not a high school student or, or a post-secondary student, but I, it's important to know that coaching and mentoring and sponsoring happens throughout your whole career and life e even. I think about it in my personal life as, as well. So um, it's so important um, to, to have that um, support system. So Martine, if you'd like to add anything more as well to this question. Yeah, and I think what you're saying, uh, Janet, is that it's, um, it's, it's a, we grow horizontally now. We're not growing hierarchically in our careers anymore. We grow horizontally as we're developing these networks. And it is really important to get out there and to find a coach, somebody who helps you grow, to find somebody to mentor you, to help you to develop those skills, and to find a sponsor that helps you to expand your network and find opportunities. Um, and it's, it's important to look outside your organization for those things as well, in my experience. Um, you know, engineering is no, no longer a siloed activity, like I was saying before, with specialists sitting behind a desk. Um, we're out there, we're engaging in projects. In the 21st century, it's multidisciplinary. Um, and that systems approach, I said previously, um, is, is something that we can engage in, not just in our formal education pathways, but in our sharing and learning and development together. And I think that this is an incredible panel with really strong women and Farzad on it. And we, we're all changers and leaders in our field. Um, but I bet you there's all of us here have experienced at one point that we've been too busy, maybe too patronized and uh, too intimidated to step up and make, make a change when we've, when we've experienced some microaggression. And so that's why I think, especially for women, it's really important to go out there to share experiences, to articulate what it is that you're looking for and you're wanting to do, and, and to try to take into account all of us together will make that cultural shift. Thank you, Martine. Wonderful um, comments you all had to share with us. The next question is talking a little bit about the global pandemic. It's hard to not talk about that. The global pandemic has really showcased the strengths and core values that women bring to help society and the importance of creating an inclusive workplace culture. So I'd like to start with asking Setre to share the importance of creating an inclusive workplace culture where women can thrive and contribute fully in the built environment sector. Setre? 
Yeah, thank you, Janet, to bring this question. It's really important to create a culture of inclusion in construction and build environment industry. As we could in, as we could see here now, the women how engineering they are now involved because how we can access to the same opportunity by this, so having harmonic work culture, as a result, we can see that we achieve desired outcome. And also we can have a, we can see the happier are committed society. And what the industry can see that is deeper trust among community, because when the women are integrated and involved, we can see more commitment and integration. And I would love to actually uh, connect this one in this question, actually this connection between industry and the daily life that we have it. Because in my belief and in my life is that the old industry that I learned is now what I'm doing in my hourly uh, daily life. And also for my student, uh, whatever I, I learned from industry to be, let's say problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, communication, collaboration, all the good things actually, management, time management. I'm trying to teach uh, my kids, my students uh, to, to, to learn it actually, to involve this uh, time management, critical thinking. And if we do this, is then a strength and unique perspective that we can see in community. So if we have, we believe all we are building in equity, so, and the women are in industry, then we could see all the positive and this, let's say a strength and all this great dynamic, let's say community. Thank you, Satri. Um, I'm going to add in, I'm going to become a panelist for a second. Um, I have sort of a different thought to this question. And um, I left industry, um, I had a family and I, I needed to have a flexible work environment. So I had mentors and people I, I met who, suggested academia would be a good fit for me. And so 10 years ago, I started in academia teaching one course and managing a very small research project. And um, I had the flexibility that I needed, but it was a lot of juggling with responsibilities at home and at work. And from there, um, um, I just fell in love with academia. I loved working with students and being on campus and you know, impacting my students' lives just as teachers had impacted mine. Um, and with this question about COVID and the pandemic, I thought about how I feel like I've had so many more wonderful and more wonderful conversations with men and women in my life, from my family to my colleagues um, at Humber. And I, I'm sort of feeling like with COVID that the skills that I bring and that women bring to work, our, our caring nature, the way we check in with the others that we work with, I feel like when I'm in meetings, typically it's the women that step up and talk about how students are feeling and how our team is working well together. And I think all of those amazing skills that we have, our strengths that we have, is really kind of coming to be during COVID. And um, I really hope there, there have been some silver linings to COVID where we, you know, even as we move back to more of a normal life, that some things don't go back to more of a normal life. I think having wonderful conversations and um, taking time to ask how we're doing, I hope we continue to do that. And I think that's something that women have always kind of been good at. And it's it's nice to see um, us able to, to take care of the people around us at work, um, you know, and at home as we've always kind of done. Um, so that's kind of my, my perspective um, on this question. Okay, next question. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties here. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Okay. Oh, finally, my last question. Finally, um, the question is, what advice uh, would you give a high school female student who is interested in pursuing a career in engineering? And I'd like to ask Marinwit that question. Sure, thank you. Um, I would say be okay with making a mistake without worrying about other people's opinion. Because often as girls, we tend to have self-doubt. I personally struggled with that. And whenever we have uh, workshops here at BCTI and I get to speak with uh, females in high school and middle school, 
they tend to have the same um, attitude. The amount of time, like we know, we would know the answer, but then we doubt ourselves and not speak up or try something new. So we have to be okay with making mistakes without other people's opinion. We really don't need anyone's reassurance or approval to validate our work. So um, we just need to have the eagerness to learn and grow to uh, make our work better and be really obsessed to improve our skills and let the quality of our work speak for itself. So just the advice I would have is be bold and be okay with making mistakes. <laughs> That's wonderful advice, Marimwit, and I'm adding to this as well. Uh, Marimwit and I do a lot of similar things where we work with a lot of high school kids, so we have experience talking and answering questions. Um, yeah. So with me, and I would say that it's a continuous process, and it's about really the stories that girls tend to tell ourselves. What we tend to tell ourselves is we maybe aren't good enough in math, we're not smart enough, it must be so hard, engineering sounds so hard, we can't do it. And so it's about telling ourselves um, that we can do it and it just takes hard work, which we're all up for anyway. Mm -hmm. And if you surround yourself with people that support you, you can really um, do anything. And so when I talk to high school kids, I always plug engineering actually <laughs> to, so that they know it's an option. But my goal as like as a mother and it's, as a teacher is to give everyone options and know that there are options, whatever your way forward is, is, is um, explore all the options. Don't rule anything out. Engineers do a whole lot more than just designing pipes. And um, if we think about um, the issues facing the world today, um, I think Farzad mentioned this as well. And we have a couple of um, panelists who work in the built environment and my background in environmental engineering. I think a lot of the world's challenges, we really need women to be part of, of those solutions. So there, there is absolutely a place um, for everyone um, in engineering because we really need everyone to be represented um, in engineering. So for young girls, I always say explore options, talk to as many people as you can and um, don't rule anything out. Every, anything is really possible um, um, with, with hard work. Um, so with those final words, um, this concludes our panel. Um, I do invite, there's a couple of things I'd like to just wrap up here. We'd like to invite our viewers to um, uh, our chat to submit any questions or comments that you have for our panelists, first of all. Um, next, we're going to launch a poll from NEM Ontario that will just take a little bit of time to complete, um, if you don't mind participating in that poll. And to our panelists, Dr. Farzad Rayagani, Dr. Martine Spinks, Dr. Setre Janbaksh, Marilyn Spink, and Marimwit Demise, yes, myself, thank you for sharing your stories and your career journeys with us tonight. We really appreciate your contributions to engineering. And to our viewers, thank you for taking the time to join us. We hope you have been inspired and can leave our online event with some new perspective and insight. And for more information on Humber's uh, new three, three of our new engineer, I'll start again. For more information on the new engineering degrees at Humber in information systems, engineering, mechatronics, and the built environment, please visit our website, humber.ca backslash backslash engineering. I think I need some water. Um, and uh, we've got lots of info sessions um, set up and you can reach out to me via email if you have any questions about that. Um, National <coughs> Engineering Month continues for the month of March with 70. Oh, there's the poll in progress. It just popped up on my screen. There are 70 free events online to choose from uh, during week four when the theme is engineering ethics impact in the future. Um, Martine, one of our panelists, will be leading a discussion along with Dr. Ali Haas on sustainability challenges in the built environment on March 22nd at 630. Um, we hope you join that session. And once again, thank you for helping us engineer her dream career. Um, and stay safe and healthy and good night. And uh, we will stay on the line and see if there's any um, questions.
I think there's one in the chat about uh, imposter syndrome, asking if any of the panelists have experienced imposter mm. syndrome, and if so, how they overcame it. I, I hope I get this right. <laughs> imposter system is, is syndrome is where women feel like they don't deserve the job they're in, and they feel like they're 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 they shouldn't it, be doing what they're doing. Is that it was Mary? actually related? I was going to say it was related to what you were talking about that little voice inside you. And, and I would say that <laughs> this, I know you're probably not talking about politics, but when I saw that some of the people that rose to leadership positions um, recently in our political sphere um, and how really they were incompetent. And when I see that, and then I think, wow, if that person can be mayor, that person be, be president of the United States, you know, wow, why am I so hard on myself? Because some of them did, they you know, there were not everything they did was bad. And, and so I, I kind of, I think sometimes we, we all suffer from that, both men and women. And I think it's, that's why the conversations are so important because when you speak to other people, you're validated. Right? So let, let me add the, with, the, with the real fact. The first that the 50%, almost 50% of our lead, my, my leadership team is a female engineer female. So let me start it. So Maria M is an engineer running $50 million operations. So she's so from the from prestigious of the engineering, from the learning of his engineering, running a $50 million operation, the most important from the Faculty of Applied Science and Technology. And Marianne and, uh, and Jen running the work integrated learning that one of the most important element of engineering education. Martin is running the one of the three cluster of the engineering technology in built environment. Janet is running three engineering degree that without Janet, we cannot even exist. So Janet, thank you so much for all the work that you do for the future engineering students because so now if, if I don't know these ladies, but one thing I know, and that is the common the engineering education. As Martin mentioned, critical thinking, thinking, system approach, communication, um, relationship building, all these element of engineering that we forget about to talk about, because all we talk is a math and science and physics, these are the critical for running operation like now that we have. And thanks to all my female faculty in the Faculty of Applied Science and Technology. And again, and happy International Women's Day to all of you. So these women are critical for the future of our economic development within Canada globally. So, I don't know that uh, how I can describe, but so important from perspective of the what we are aiming, what we are, are our vision is that you participate and again we welcome you to come to the discipline that is is yours. It's not ours. It's yours. But what you take from this discipline is what we take from all of us as individuals. So eventually, I think that what a skill set and competency that we learn from the engineering education is beyond the engineering. Thank you, Farsad. Uh, the only little thing I would add to the imposter syndrome is um, I saw a really interesting TED talk about how men can work with a fake it till you make it type of mentality. Whereas women, we tend to want to know that we're going to do something well and, and perfectly. We put that pressure on ourselves that we don't want to take on something unless we have done it before. I know this is the story in, in my own head. Um, I, 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 and so I think, um, I think we have to be more brave to push out of that, to feel like we can do it. We might not know everything. We might not know all the answers. It might be hard, but um, but we should try and it's okay to make mistakes, which is what Marion Witt had mentioned that that letting ourselves make mistakes, not expect perfection, know that it might be hard, but that, that we can do it, I think is um, something that we need to think about to overcome that imposter syndrome. 
I agree. And I think it's also building on what Miriam Witt said, it's, it's girls being scared of ridicule and really targeting those, those young teenage girls and showing them that it's okay to fail, it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to be wrong and, and to feel safe in taking that, that chance and that challenge and not having to try to be right all the time. Because definitely, I, I can definitely say in my early career, I worried very much to speak up sometimes or was I supposed to be there? because I thought I would be judged more harshly by many of my male colleagues who were, who were many of my managers, to be honest, than I, that I thought I would for, for maybe my male counterparts. And that was maybe partially true, but also partially the pressure that I put upon myself. Thanks, Martine. I think we have Susanna, do you wanna add? I see Susanna has written that you wanted to talk about imposter syndrome. Did you wanna chat? No? Any other questions? Um, oh, I just want to or comments? add a little bit to okay. that. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit about the imposter. Um, oh, is Susanna ready to, she can speak? I wasn't sure. It's okay, after you very No, it's okay. I had, uh, you know, I just, in terms of the culture of the organization and, and maybe women end up feeling this way because we are ridiculed because we're expected to be better. Um, we have to perform twice as good. So we need to look, start looking at cultures of organizations where, where there's a double standard, where the women have to perform at this level, whereas the men can perform here. And, it's, and there's some really interesting research coming out on that in terms of organizational behavior. Um, we see it in our late women politicians. Many of our women politicians, they get elected once, but they never get elected again because they're not allowed to make a mistake. We hold them high. So it's, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. Interesting Anyways, perspective, Marilyn. Interesting perspective. Thanks, Marilyn. Susanna, did you want to add to that? Yes, in regards to the imposter syndrome, sometimes I think uh, once we become professional engineers, I think uh, women are more compliant generally. We are not supposed to take our work that we are, don't feel qualified for. So if they don't offer training for, so we could uh, reach that level of uh, expertise, we don't take the, the job. It's as simple as that, because we don't want to endanger someone or to endanger the, the environment. My apologies, I have an allergy, so by, from wearing the mask all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's another aspect. It's, it, it might not be imposter syndrome, it might be just, uh, compliance, that's what I would call it, as not to apply for jobs that we're not qualified for. And I read it, I read somewhere, I'm not sure if it's true, but I read that uh, women wouldn't lie as often as men generally. And if they lie, they lie for the community, for the uh, well-being of others generally, to save people, not to save themselves. So that might be another issue. So I don't know if it's true or not, but, uh, that's what I read. Thank you. I had a little bit of trouble hearing you, but Thank you um, for, I think uh, yeah, it's my voice. So no, it's that's all right. No, There's it's an, not. There's a, a bit of a. Um, it's just. It's just virtual. That's that's all. That's all what right. it is. Thank but, you for the opportunity. Oh, There's another welcome. question in the chat. Um, do you find that the wage gap between genders and engineering has improved over the last few years? I don't know that I'm the best to ask this because I've had, um, I work in consulting and contract work. So it's, it's, it, I ride a roller coaster anyway. <laughs> so Marilyn, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just, uh, what I, what um, OSFI, which is the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers did some research into this. And what they found was that there isn't a large wage gap um, with women. And because, um, there's a certain set boundary for like a junior engineer, junior technician, designers, senior designers. Uh, but what they found was that the women had more qualifications, but hadn't been advanced, which is a little, it's a nuance. It means the women, they're, they were ready to be advanced. They're making the same monies as their peers, but they really should maybe be an intermediate designer versus a junior. And so that was something that uh, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers was looking at. Um, and, uh, you know, I found just in my career, 
um, sometimes I've made more money than my male colleagues. So that that's a personal um, uh, experience. I, I'm not sure that's the same. Hmm. But I've been in mine, which tends to pay pretty well. Um, with that, I wonder with, um, um, I know this is my own personal story, but balancing, balancing family and work has, has been kind of my, the thing I've been doing for about 10 years. And I, I heard a CBC documentary that talked about how countries in Northern Europe in particular that had um, um, equal parental leave between um, the two partners really um, made great strides in that a pay equity because it meant that um, the woman wouldn't volunteer to stay back that if it was use it or lose it and equal between both partners that that would keep women in their careers um, and advancing so i don't think that's the only answer but i think that's that's one thing that might support as well if um if there are government programs that support women's that was my personal story because I did take time off to spend at yeah. home and I think it did impact my um, um, my progress in my career, but yeah. I know there are many. Um, I think different ways we can look Setra at this. could speak yeah. to this. Yeah. Yeah. Sweden. Actually, it's my experience I would love to share actually I ha I was with my colleague with the same qualification I can tell even maybe less in Sweden, like my salary was higher. I can tell you. So it's the culture, it's the government, yes, that support the women. So I got a more salary compared to my colleague, which was men. So I, I can tell this is a story. And also in all this support that they provide for the women, uh, I remember I had around 450 something parental, let's say leave that four months for, was for the men. And uh, I mean, around, the rest was for the, let's say, for the mom. So I had experience, so the government, they should, or the education culture should, let's say, support the woman. So I could see that this is, what really inspired me was there. I could see that how the women in society, in the industry, how they are strong because they have a power to talk and they have enough um, time and, I don't know, ability, they support them to have a good mom time for the at home and also to be involved in industry because, because everything was equal and even more support they could get it uh, compared to the men. So yeah, this is something that we needed actually to have more here, this uh, for the women's here and more support we needed actually. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah. Marilyn? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I struggle with this myself. I'm a, I'm a mom and I slowed down during my career, but um, in Sweden, my understanding is that they have equal pay uh, maternity and parental leave. And to me, this is a parenting issue. And sometimes we start talking about women and we hang the child um, is, and on women. But there's so many women that don't have children that experience, experience barriers and bias in their career. So I think we need to support, we need to change the conversation, change the narrative, as Merowit says, is that it's a parenting issue and companies need to support parents. And if you, um, and this analogy of what's happening in Sweden, years ago, I used to work in Finland, um, they had 18 months of parental leave for both parents. And what they did was they took half days. So they might've taken a little bit of time off of their vacation, got settled with the new child. And then each of them worked a half day for three years. So the parent worked in the morning, one did, and one worked in the afternoon. The grandparents weren't, didn't have the kids all day, you know, maybe covered a little bit over the lunch hour when there was a switch over. And then um, by the time the three years came up, maybe they were having another child. So they ended up having um, another 18 months each. And so it really supports young families. And that's kind of like the direction that I would like to hear because there's two parents. There's <laughs> you're typically in some families, sometimes they're single parents, but men are parents too. And we can't not have this discussion without them. I love where this conversation's going. <laughs> Very personal stories here. Uh, did anyone want to add or let's see if we I, I have a I see a comment here from Michaela.
Wonderful example, Michaela. I've had a couple of students who, um, in their case, they spoke English as a second language, and they, um, you know, reflected on that, realized that it might be a challenge for them, and so they did volunteer. They, um, I was a part of a makerspace initiative where um, it was a very safe space where students went to the library and taught kids and their parents how to use three D printers. It was very simple but they were able to practice their everyday English conversational skills in a safe place where they were considered the expert in, in the technology. And they found it really rewarding. And it was really, um, it was really the building block to them uh, moving into their uh, work terms, into their capstone project and into you know, employment upon graduation. So um, I'm a big proponent of, of volunteering and community engagement as well, but it's wonderful that you've um, recognize that about yourself, Michaela, and took steps to to improve your communication skills. And there's a lot of a lot of people who have the same um, um, challenges. Any comments there from our panel? No. Oh, Marimwit. Yeah. Um, I just want to add on that. Uh, English was my second language too, and that was actually one of the things. Um, I was insecure about. And the other thing was that the fact that I, had, I didn't have any technical background before coming to Canada. I studied social work and jazz for a year and a half. So it was completely different from engineering or technology. Um, but what really helped me was um, watching my male um, classmates being not afraid to make a mistake. And they were just roll with it. They were, they were just okay. And, and I was like, if they are okay, why should I be afraid? Why should I be insecure to make a mistake or say the wrong answer? And then by realizing that every mistake is an opportunity to learn. And once you understand that, I think you get the freedom to just explore all your potentials. Hi, uh, my name is Michaela. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you for reading uh, my comment, first of all. And yes, I, that's exactly what I felt. I, I felt uh, the inadequacy because everybody was so confident in their answers and in their presence. Uh, and there were moments in my, in my career where I was the only woman in the room in a tutorial. Um, I'm in civil engineering. I'm, I'm actually graduating this year. So I've had to battle with this for a couple of months and I realized that it um, actually damaged my, even my interview skills, that, that mm -hmm. lack of confidence that I had. So I, I looked into this club and the club, again, it's full of men, all confident. It's called Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm not sure. Yeah, we have full, of, <laughs> full of men and, um, and just trying to step out of my comfort zone to express my accomplishments really helped me. But to have that, that's the first step took a big, a big, um, a lot of courage for me as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for that. sharing. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's really wonderful that you shared and um, congratulations on uh, nearing completion. That's a wonderful achievement and accomplishment. And uh, I just wanted to quickly add something too, since we have a few PhDs on the panel. Um, and I'm sure that uh, uh, we, we all understand too the importance of uh, a lot of the PhD students actually in, academ in academia, they suffer from uh, imposter syndrome uh, because in PhD, you're supposed to go above and beyond of the current knowledge in order to put that little bump in human knowledge to make it expand. So a lot of people suffer in that. And I think that the best way to do it, and I think that uh, all the PhD grads probably would know is that in your dissertation, uh, you are supposed to talk about what are the limitations of your research? Uh, what are the things that you don't know about? So, so I think that that would be a good way to, uh, in general, even in the engineering field, to put a check on the imposter syndrome, because as long as you know what the limitations are and what you don't know, and why you don't know them, then it's okay. Then you feel good about it because that you know that you don't know everything and you know what you don't know. So in, in that case, I think that it would be good to make sure that we are not having that imposter syndrome because I think that, that, that that's a really key feature in, uh, in, in uh, dealing with that particular issue. Thank you. I missed your comment. Uh, is this Dr. Enoch? 
See? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for sharing. Actually, um, in our, not to just plug our engineering degrees, but um, as you probably know, in engineering, engineering, uh, engineering education, we have a graduate attribute around lifelong learning. And so we took a lot of time to think about that outcome for our graduates at Humber. And so what we've put together um, is a plan where students can reflect and identify skills and knowledge that they're lacking and using more of a digital passport type of system where they can um, you know, reflect on their own um, skills gap and then not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom as well, volunteering with work, um, they can build this digital passport to track their progress um, in closing this, the skills gaps they, they may have. And as someone who teaches in engineering, I know that communication skills is, is one of those skills gaps. But um, I think throughout, you know, I tell them as a professor that throughout my whole career, I, I'm also always thinking about lifelong learning and what do I need to improve on? How do I keep up with um, with changes that are happening? Because if there's anything we know in engineering is that it's always changing and um, things are moving so fast, so many innovations and disruptions to how we solve problems um, that um, we always have to be reflecting on our on our skills. So um, thank you for sharing that. I, we, we've included that in some, we, we also are offering project-based learning. So part of that is for students to reflect on um, what don't they know. And then as Martine mentioned, um, having a multidisciplinary approach to solving problems is really, um, we think going to help help that where they they recognize their own limits and they know where they have to go to find the answers and not feel like they have to be an expert in, in everything so it's it's interesting to hear that you you have that even in you know phd programs as well so interesting thanks for sharing any other comments <laughs> There's some funny things happening in the chat right now. <laughs> we'll wait another couple of seconds. Yes, I guess we'll all leave here. We'll all go do the second shift now. It's uh, for us <laughs> yes. children, right? It's second shift time. It's unpaid work time. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone, so much. I know we've already said our good night. So thanks, everyone. And keep Thank in touch. You. Keep in touch and reach out if uh, you'd like to ask us any questions or stay connected through LinkedIn or wherever. Yeah. I just certain. wanted to add that uh, there was a lovely positive thing that happened uh, about a week or so ago, and I think it was, is that our engineering regulator um, has sort of moved forward with mandatory continuing professional development for engineers. And that was uh, a very positive thing for our profession. So it's expected of you as a professor, you know, as a professional or a fitness instructor instructors have to do it so <laughs> why not engineers makes so, sense so i was very happy to see that council saw that and voted it in yeah wonderful well, that was a that. topic for the march 1st that was a all three of the leaders of our engineering organizations talked about that last month wonderful thank you thanks everyone thanks mike thank, I hope thank your you daughter so enjoyed it. thank you, See you, thank later, you.